Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. We're recording this podcast on December the 7th, 2020. In the past week, we have heard lots about vaccines, preparing for vaccines, and the news surrounding them, and the fact that the first vaccine has been approved for <laughs> use in the United Kingdom. Here in the U.S., plans are underway for vaccine distribution as COVID-19 vaccines are nearing approval here as well. Well, today, our favorite expert on vaccines is here to visit with us. Dr. Greg Poland returns. He is a Mayo Clinic infectious disease expert, vaccine expert, and virologist. Welcome back, Greg. Thank you. Good to be back. Well, wonderful to have you here on talking about vaccines. I know this is practically your favorite topic, so thanks for being here. Of course. So tell us a little, Greg, about the vaccine that was approved in the United Kingdom uh, for use. Is that under the emergency use authorization or is it completely approved by their FDA equivalent? No, you're exactly right, Helena. This was a, a, the equivalent of an emergency use authorization. Um, and so they're going to start with healthcare workers and long-term care residents, uh, as well as elderly, much like we will, uh, in fact, in the US. Greg, um, last time you told us a little bit about the ACIP, and if you could tell us again what that is, and I think they make recommendations on who gets the vaccines first in the United States. Tell us how that process is going to work. Yeah, just very briefly, uh, and I have served on all of these uh, committees, so I have a pretty detailed knowledge of them. The FDA has a committee they call VERPAC. They're the ones that will review the data and make a recommendation to FDA. Once FDA says, yep, this is a go, and we anticipate the VERPAC meeting to be this Thursday, then it will go over to CDC. CDC has an advisory committee called the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, ACIP, as you mentioned. They're responsible for the implementation phase of it. So in this sense, that they will make recommendations about who should get the vaccine, what precautions, you know, the, the operational details of immunization. They make that recommendation to CDC, CDC takes that under uh, advisement and then issues a recommendation. Then what will happen in a third stage is that each state will decide within that priority who will get immunized. So for example, uh, stage 1A is healthcare providers, as, as one example. But which healthcare providers? So each state and each institution will have some latitude within which to make those decisions. Greg, I saw a fascinating picture last week of some freezers that uh, Mayo Clinic has obtained to store vaccine. And if I'm not incorrect, they said that each of them can store about 45,000 doses of vaccine and they were chilling them to minus 74 degrees Celsius. And there were five of them. It was really fascinating to me. Yeah. So what about distributing whichever of these vaccines we're going to be using? Are we ready to do that? And what an incredible process that must be. Yeah, I mean, I think we're very fortunate, Mayo Clinic, we're ready. There have been a lot of people putting a tremendous amount of time uh, into thinking about this. So, so we're ready. That may not be true for other, particularly more rural or smaller areas where the logistics and economics of it are, are, are difficult. But you're exactly right. Those freezers store many uh, thousands of doses of vaccine. They have to be kept at minus 70, 75, which is about minus 104 Fahrenheit. That's colder than Antarctica, <laughs> a lot colder. Um, and then they can be put in the refrigerator and thawed for use uh, in, in actual immunization. So a whole process at Mayo Clinic has been designed from start to finish and how we're gonna do this, what waves of immunization are gonna occur and the actual you know, when you think about it, it's sort of a choreographed dance as to how this happens, because you don't want a single dose of vaccine to get wasted. So that was going to be my question to you, Greg, that it, you defrost it before administering it, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so it must warm up somewhat for a period of time. Right, right. So uh, that's exactly true. You can hold it in at refrigerator temperatures for a few hours. Each vaccine is different. And then at room temperature, for a very short period of time in order to enable 
logistically actual immunization to occur. So, you know, when you think about, we're gonna start with the Pfizer. So you can hold the Pfizer at refrigerator temperature for five days and at room temperature for about two hours. When you get to the Moderna vaccine, you're talking about 30 days in a refrigerator and about uh, 12 hours at room temperature. So there is a little leeway, but not a lot like other vaccines. And that's peculiar to these mRNA vaccines. Greg, we are uh, obviously working on our communication plan at Mayo Clinic and, and our distribution plan. And one of the things that I noted in some of the information uh, that we're distributing is that they mentioned that people can feel ill after receiving the vaccine. And can you explain to us why that would be and how long is it anticipated to last? Yeah, you're very right about this. And this is something we have to be careful to educate people about. If you don't warn them, about the normal expected sensations and feelings that they'll experience, they'll think it's something wrong, and it's not. When you give vaccines like this, what you expect, what you hope, is that your immune cells see this, react to it, they elaborate or secrete a number of chemicals called cytokines and chemokines, which attract other immune cells so that you build a high antibody titer which in turn protects you. That process makes you feel similar to what you feel when you're like, quote, starting to get the flu. So we've all experienced a sore arm, maybe redness, swelling, something like that. But uh, a moderate amount of people can expect to have a low-grade fever, headache, fatigue, you know, maybe not feeling well for a few hours. All of this resolves without any treatment it can tend to be a little more worse with the second dose. But when you look at severe side effects, you're talking less than single digit percents. So these are indications that the vaccine is in fact working. So uh, I wouldn't be afraid of it. Uh, I, I'd be more concerned if you felt nothing absolutely at all. Well, that um, gave me a follow-up question for you that I'm I'm sure some of our listeners might uh, wonder as well, if you have those types of symptoms which sound, sound a little bit like COVID symptoms, how yeah. do you know if you should go to work or if you should get tested for COVID? Yeah, this is a really practical question because uh, particularly for the workplace, you don't want to give everybody a vaccine all at once, have confusion like that. Remember, some people just by chance alone will be developing COVID, right? So uh, it depends on if you're, if you're developing a cough, shortness of breath, fever, loss of uh, smell or taste, that would put it into a high index of suspicion about COVID. We send those people to go and get tested. But the sore arm, low grade fever, without a cough, without a sore throat, um, without loss of, of smell or taste, that's a vaccine expected side effect and not to worry about that. Now, there, there are some people, uh, for example, in uh, professions where uh, maybe a sore arm would be detrimental. Let's say a surgeon, for example. That may be somebody who wants to take a vaccine on a day when they're not operating the following day, because these side effects are very transitory. They don't require treatment. They last a couple hours to at longest about 24 to 36 hours. Well, that's good information to have going into getting a vaccine, potentially. Yeah. Um, Greg, will people who have had documented cases of COVID need to get vaccinated? My sense is yes. Now, we don't have a lot of data on this, frankly. And part of the problem is we don't have large-scale numbers of people of different age, of different, uh, with different medical problems to know when will their antibody titers start to wane such that they become infected? We certainly know of cases of people who had documented COVID and then some months later were reinfected. So we know it can occur. For that reason alone, the recommendation is going to be immunize everybody. Nonetheless, in, in a time of shortage, for example, perhaps in some communities, they might say something like, well, if you had documented COVID and it's been 
uh, within eight to 12 weeks, maybe we'll hold you until the next shipment of vaccine. But right now, that is not the recommendation. Okay. Um, Greg, I noted that the CDC has given some updates about the information that they share with the public about COVID, and one of them was regarding quarantine time. Could you explain that to me? I want to be very clear about what CDC is doing here. What they noticed is that the best practice, which is 14 days of quarantine after exposure, was not being adhered to. So as a second best compromise in order to increase compliance, what they're saying is that if you had exposure and you have no symptoms but no test, you can be in quarantine for 10 days and then come out. If you have a test and it's negative, seven days of quarantine. Now, here's the key part. You cannot exclude with either of those levels of quarantine a risk as low as 1% to as high as 12%. Of still being, uh, of still having COVID and being able to transmit it. So it's not perfect, but it's a population level strategy to try to get some level of quarantine among people who are unwilling to quarantine for 14 days. I feel like it just gets more and more complicated, Greg. <laughs> We've talked before about who, who are your close contacts and how long do you have to be around them for to be close contacts. And the same thing with the quarantine. It's it's getting a little complex. You know, uh, and, and you're very right about that. And, and, and that makes adherence difficult, doesn't it? I, I think the, the rule of thumb is this. The more time you're around somebody outside of your family, the more people you're around, the greater your risk of acquiring COVID. And people should not underestimate this. We are looking at over 100,000 Americans currently in the hospital. We are right now approaching about one out of every 1,300 Americans have died of COVID. This is common, it's extensive, and it continues to surge. So we need to take these things very seriously and dampen this curve down. Wow, so that brings us again, we're still in the holiday season. Uh, and before Thanksgiving, you and I did a program where you strongly recommended, along with the CDC, that individuals not travel during the holidays or have large gatherings in their home of uh, friends and family members. Right. I imagine this still holds true for Christmas, which is rapidly right. upon us. Uh, but the CDC now recommends that if you're going to travel, that you are tested first. Is this contradictory or, um, and when do you get tested before you travel? You know, it's a, it's a difficult public health and communication problem because the best recommendation to keep the most people the safest is do not travel, do not gather, even in small groups with people outside your family and, and your work. People are not adhering to that. Exactly what we said would happen after Thanksgiving is happening. We are experiencing a major surge in the number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths that are occurring. Recognizing that, CDC saying, well, if you're not gonna listen to the best advice available, the second best doesn't preclude you from getting infected, but the second best is to say, get tested one to three days before travel, assuming you can get your test result back in enough time. Test, get tested again three to five days later. And then finally, home quarantine for seven days when you get back. Now, what do you think the chances are that people are gonna adhere to a three-stage process like that? And yet we have been unable to convince the American public in the numbers needed. Certainly some people have taken it seriously, but we have been unable to relate just how serious this is and what uh, having millions of people transit through airports does in the context of a pandemic. Greg, we have talked before about testing and that originally testing was for people who really felt that they were sick with COVID or there was significant concern. It sounds like you're, uh, and the CDC is advising that people who are asymptomatic be tested. Are 
asymptomatic individuals able to get tests? Yeah, you know, it is different by locale. So uh, that CDC recommendation, in a sense, pretends that testing is widely available and that you could get it back in a period of time to actually be actionable. I just had a, a close friend who was exposed and it took almost seven days, this was another state, almost seven days for him to get his result back. So obviously this isn't gonna work in a lot of locales. Yeah, that, that makes sense. This has been great information, very practical that you've shared with us today, Greg. Do you have any last words of wisdom for us? You know, I, I am, I, I am beside myself in many ways. Who wants to be the last casualty of this pandemic? And yet there's going to be many thousands who will be. People who are our parents, our friends, God forbid, our children. But if we do not take this seriously, the best estimate right now is that by this April, one in 700 Americans will have died of COVID. And this is unnecessary. Please wear a mask. Please maintain distance. Just hang on a few more months. These vaccines are coming. We are very likely to start the first wave of immunizations before the end of this year with many millions of doses coming after that. It's not worth it to not treat yourself and your health with the importance that it deserves. So, so please take precautions, please. We are, we are at a stage that we, we are uh, in many locations around the US, we are now doing crisis care, which is not state of the art best care. We have too many ill people and too few healthcare providers. One in 700 is a sobering number, but you've mm -hmm. brought us hope today as well. We know that the vaccine is very, very close, uh, probably faster even than many believed it would be available. Yes, and, and these vaccines look to be not only stunningly effective, but safe. And if we can get these distributed out, and, and when we have vaccines of this quality, if we can get people to take them, we are going to see a resumption of normal activities. So it's actually counterproductive to not wear masks and distance. It will prolong the pandemic rather than quickly get to what all of us want, which is to be with our family and our loved ones and our friends. Um, and, and we will get there, but with how much pain? What is it you always tell us, Greg? Hands, face, and space. Hands, face, space. Think positive, but test negative. Wonderful. Thanks for being here, Greg. My pleasure. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic virologist and vaccine expert, Dr. Greg Poland, for being with us again today to give us some updates, particularly on vaccines. I hope that you learned something. I know that I did. And we wish you a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well.